Surprise! It's not Blade Runner. Um, unfortunately, we had some issues come up, so instead we're going to be running our 2001 backlog. Um, I think this is a really good episode, so I think you're going to enjoy it anyway. We should still plan on doing Blade Runner 2049 next week, and we are going to be doing a Blade Runner episode at some point, but when that is, I don't know. Um, until then, enjoy 2001. Welcome to Beating a Dead Horse. As always, I'm your host, Sean McKinda. And I'm your host, Jackson Keller. And this week, we're going to be talking about 2001, A Space Odyssey. Now, 2001 is a gorgeously designed music video, sporadically intercut with some wildly varying plot points that still somehow manages to pull itself together and form a comprehensive and wonderful story. Yeah, I'd say that about sums it up. Uh, it's sort of strange how... That's a, it's a really famous story, but the famous parts don't really appear until about an hour in. Uh, but it is a com- it is a comprehensive story for sh- for sure. Yeah, we spend a, what you're expecting to see. What everyone is expecting to see is Hal and I can't let you do that, Dave, and everything else that you think of when you think of 2001. And I hadn't seen this movie before a couple of weeks ago, and I don't think either of us had. Um, this was my first uh, Kubrick film, actually. I had not seen any of his other work. No kidding. Yeah. You're in for a treat. There's some good stuff in there. Um, but it was not at all what I was expecting. I went into this knowing that this was a movie released a ways back when science fiction was still slow and um, kind of a, a building science. It was. It's, it's very 60s and 70s. Very yeah. much cut from that cloth. <laughs> So it was I was not prepared for 20 minutes of apes. I knew that there were apes in the movie. I didn't think it would be 20 minutes long. I wasn't prepared for multiple 5 minute long musical numbers like classical musical numbers that are gorgeously shot and beautifully done just about three and a half minutes too long for me and i'm someone who generally can appreciate a long scene that's kind of setting up where you are or just something that takes a minute to appreciate look at what we can do which is a lot of what this movie is it was it's incredible to watch it is visually stunning they are working with technology and camera techniques that are hard to replicate nowadays even with green screen technology and everything it was it, it's it's stunning to watch and if you think you can sit through some exorbitantly slow parts to this movie i can't recommend it enough i thought it was absolutely incredible despite the you know shit i've been giving it for three minutes now I think an important thing to keep in mind, too, is considering how both of us watched this movie for the first time, because they were very different experiences. Uh, Sean saw it on the big screen in its intended format on the original film, actually, but unfortunately, I did not get into town quick enough to join him. It was already gone from the uh, local independent theater by the time I arrived. Shout out to the Gateway in Columbus! <laughs> you, you guys you guys do great work there! Uh, anyway... Um, so I had to make do with watching it in standard definition on YouTube because that was the cheapest option. And as a film, you still get the, you still are impressed by the craft behind it. Like, you know, Kubrick, Kubrick, I get the sense, uh, just from what I've heard and from what I've seen in this film and that he's much more interested in the in the craft than like the some maybe more character driven correct uh, directors and that really shows and everything looks really excellent even in that sort of uh confined space because this isn't uh 
this is an occasion like Alien where even though Alien mostly looks really good still, there are a couple shots that look a little cheap, look a little dated. Uh, everything here, like those apes at the beginning, it takes you like a solid 10 minutes to decide whether those are like actual animals or people in costumes. Like you're, it looks really good. And Even on the big screen, I was entirely lost as to whether they were people or not. I, no lie, did spend the first 10 minutes arguing with myself whether they were people or not because there would be moments where I'm like, all right, they looked like they were walking a little bit like a person there. And then the facial design is so absolutely incredible that I'm like, oh, no, they have to actually be apes. There's no way that those are people. And so it, it, they did some lovely stuff. Yeah, so the film looks fucking spectacular. And part of the problem, though, is that you lose a little bit of that majesty when you are viewing it, like, on a really crappy TV on a card table like I did. <laughs> uh, and... Um, so, as f- it's, so basically, like, when it comes down to my opinions on this movie, it's undoubtedly a great film, but it's a film that I feel like is sort of hard to recommend, because you have to be a certain type of person to want to watch it, and even then, you're gonna get the most out of it if you see it in the ideal experience, you know, on, on the film, up on the big screen, uh, doing, you know, go- going whole hog, basically, uh, because for your average person who just wants to see uh, a spacefaring science fiction film with, you know, maybe an AI subplot, uh, it's sort of hard to recommend this one over something that's a little more, a little more modern in the pacing. Uh, doesn't, I can see a lot of people, actually, actually, I remember the first time I was ever, uh, had even heard of this movie was because my mom, who is a big science fiction fan was talking about how this movie like bordered tears and she loves movies like alien and star wars uh and i feel like that's about kind of where your average person would be on this movie so in order i think to really enjoy it and really appreciate the craft and the spectacle uh and some of the more nuanced more nuanced elements you'd have to be a pretty hardcore cinephile but then that's also no, really no use recommending it, because this is the kind of movie done by such a director with such a well-known body of work in such a groundbreaking movie that most real, cine- like, true cinephiles had already seen it. Uh, Which so... it says to the fact that neither of us had. So, I mean, like, don't let us seem like we're talking down at anyone if you haven't seen this movie. We don't want to come across that way. It's It is genuinely hard to get through even like i said i was fully prepared for a slow movie my dad warned me going into this like it's gonna be slow i can tell you that right now i am and i knew what i was getting into and it was it's rough and if you're not prepared for that you're not gonna like it especially because as i said it's 20 minutes of apes and then you get about five minutes of actual conversation before it slips back into five minutes of a ship slowly moving through space while you have like classical opera in the background and if you're not prepared for that you're not gonna like it so please don't think that we're talking down like we're trying to be as average viewer as possible i mean let me speak frankly if we weren't doing this for the podcast, I don't know if I would have made it through the apes. I, like, just sitting there trying to watch it uh, on a stream. I think this is also why seeing it in the theater would be optimal, because once you get it, it and you're and you're really appreciating what's happening, uh, it's it's cool. But in, in those first, it goes on for much longer than you're expecting it to or prepared for. Uh, so if you're just sitting there watching it on a stream, on, like, Netflix or whatever... Uh, the temptation to turn it off and go watch something more modern is very strong. The other thing about the theater experience, too, is that you don't have uh, your phone blowing up every three seconds uh, and, like, just all the general distractions. Like, you're there, you're there. I saw, actually, in the comments, I don't know why I scrolled down to the YouTube comments for the paid rental of 2001 a space odyssey but my god i did you uh, poor soul and and i wasn't there for long um 
but someone in the comments had said something along the lines of, like, 2001 isn't a film that you watch. It's a film that you experience. And I think that sounds about right. Uh, you gotta have that mindset of going yeah. in, going in not to so much get really invested in, like, a, like a character or something, but just yeah, take, take in this work of art and craftsmanship and, and really sit back and, and enjoy some of the, like, headier, like, out there ideas and ponder the meaning of the universe. <laughs> and as someone who did see this in a theater, in a theater with 70, or I think it was even 35 millimeter film, I don't remember which at this point, um, in 2017, you know, 40, 50 years after it's come out, I can safely say that that is absolutely the case, is that you just kind of have to let go and just let it ride. It is an experience to be had, and it's, I, if you, seriously, if it, if you have a theater that's playing it, it doesn't even matter if it's on film or if it's digital or whatever, go watch it. It's, it's incredible. It forces you to put down your phone. It forces you to put away distractions. It's so, so worth it, and it was such an incredible film to behold on the screen. I will absolutely go see it again in theaters if it comes back, despite the fact that it is, like, three hours long. I saw it in theaters, and there was a literal intermission in it. An hour and a half through it, we get this thing that shows up intermission, and we had 15 minutes to go to the bathroom and stuff. It was an actual intermission in a movie, which I had never seen before. Had you not seen a movie with an intermission before? Because that used to be pretty common, and I was actually thinking, like, God, wouldn't this be nice to have now that, like, Batman vs. Superman is three hours and shit? Uh... No, I hadn't. I'd seen movies with, like, joke intermissions in it, or... They might not have been joke at the time. They might have been legitimate, but I've never seen a movie in theaters with an intermission where I got an intermission. Mm, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so it was a little different, a little little wild. With that, though, we're going to kind of start dipping into some spoilers, I think. Uh, we're going to kind of start talking about how this movie handles death and how it kind of makes it its theme throughout. And I'm really excited about this because I think it's a really, really cool theme and it's one that you have to think on for a while. Um, I will preface this though by saying that there isn't a right answer to this movie. Um, it is very, very abstract in its overall themes and its overall plot. So if you disagree or if you look at what we're about to kind of make our points to conclude at and think, wow, you guys are totally wrong, let us know. Like, I'm very curious to hear other takes on this. I've done a bunch of research for this. I'm going to leave a couple of extra readings down below for you to take a look at if you are so inclined because everyone kind of comes away with this with a different interpretation, and that is how Kubrick and Clark wanted it to be. It's They don't have a set, this is what it means. So, let's start talking about this. Yeah, because there's not a lot of death in this movie, but the deaths that do happen are very noticeable just because of how few and far between they are, but also very understated in a strange way. Uh, so I, I think this doesn't seem like an obvious choice. Uh, uh, this film doesn't seem like an obvious choice for a movie death podcast, but I think when you when you start uncovering those layers... Uh, that's where a lot of the more interesting ideas and themes about this movie start to pop up. So, like, like you said, yeah, uh, it is all. All the themes are based around life and death, and at least in my interpretation of this movie. So it's it's cool when you kind of start to peel back the layers and see, wow, I see why this person died here, and I see what this did here. But it's the type of thing that you only see once you have the entire experience of the movie. So let's dive into our first death, which we have one of our infamous apes getting mauled by a cheetah. This is the type of thing where I had originally written this death off as just kind of a, a demonstration of the harshness of nature. And it wasn't until I was talking to Jackson before we started recording that it kind of all came full circle and I understood the point of this. So, when you see this monkey killed, he's in a group of other apes, and the cheetah goes to pounce on him. And, of course, it succeeds. It's a cheetah. It's going to catch him. 
Um, it catches them, kills them, and everything else panics. It's all instinct. It's all id. It's all self-preservation. All the other apes, all the other creatures nearby flee. They no longer. They, they leave this ape to its fate. They leave it to die. So this leads us into our second death, where one of the other apes comes back to this feeding hole thing um, and discovers bones and, for whatever reason, decides to start bashing a skull bone with a other bone. Wow, with a other bone. With a femur. <laughs> yes, with a femur. Um, decides to start bashing the skull bone with a femur. And in doing so, like, rhythmically to the drum beat and everything like that, you see him smash the skull. At this point, you start to understand that the apes are evolving. They are learning the use of tools. They then take these tools and use them to essentially dominate this other tribe of monkeys, apes, whatever, that were vying for the same watering hole. And... In doing so, they take a, another step forward in evolution. They go from apes who are acting in self-preservation, fleeing from threats, to apes that are in control and slowly moving forward and up the food chain. And this is about where the first obelisk shows up. Um, the obelisks are just stone, theoretically stone, towers. They are... A 16 by 9 ratio, interestingly enough. Uh, there's <laughs> theories about that as being reminiscent of a movie screen turned sideways, um, which is a whole another interesting discussion. But yeah. they, at one point, throw a bone up, and it's a smash cut into a spaceship. So we skip, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand years or so. I don't have an exact number on that one. Yeah, but the the other the other interesting thing about that smash cut that really caught my attention is, you know, especially since this film is so famous now, and the famous stuff is the Hal and Dave segment of the movie, and ever everyone kind of know how that plays out. Uh, it's the classic rogue AI story, so you kind of have that in your mind when, with that context, you're watching the film. Uh, so it interestingly creates this association. Not just with evolution, but technology with violence. Um, it's already kind of planting that seed that this go this leap forward for for man for apes uh, by using the bone to club this ape from a rival group to death uh, is instantly matched to a spaceship, which uh, will become the site of a good deal of violence at the hands of another piece of advanced technology. And, um, not entirely related to the kind of a sub-theme, subplot to the overarching, uh, narrative of evolution, but I thought it was an uh, interesting thing that jumped out at me. Uh. Yeah, that is actually kind of interesting. I hadn't really thought about that, especially because it doesn't necessarily agree with kind of the progressive themes of the rest of the movie. Just kind of a, a statement that technology, while good, can also beget violence. There's, there's a little, it introduces a little bit of tension there, uh, which I think is very interesting. And, and that, that was sort of, uh, that was like probably my, one of my favorite shots in the whole movie, that match cut. I mean, you could argue that it's, that it's heavy handed, but it really, um, it feels like a great payoff to those 20 minutes of apes. It makes it feel really important on a thematic level and make sure that you've been like really paying attention, uh, to the rest of the, uh, sci-fi ex exploration plot that you were kind of expecting more from a movie called a space odyssey so yeah yeah <laughs> it was 2001 and it was just fucking apes for 20 minutes <laughs> great gorillas in the mist <laughs> <laughs> so at this point we shift focus obviously from apes to a a much more mo futuristic i should say take where we are now following a doctor named Dr. Haywood Floyd, who is arriving on the moon because for some unspecified governmental spooky black ops thing going on. Um, we later find out relatively shortly, actually, with, you know, some intercut spinning dance numbers that are gorgeous, but 
three and a half minutes too long, neither here nor there, um, that he is on the moon because they have found an obelisk. Exactly like the one that the apes had. No idea what happened with the apes. It doesn't matter. And that's the whole thing, is that what you don't see in this movie doesn't matter. It's just kind of, you got to forget about it. Um, so we end up with Haywood Floyd heading over to this obelisk on the moon where he is met with a sharp piercing ring and then a smash cut to the next set. Um, 18, mo- 18 months later when they're on the mission to Jupiter, uh, an hour into the film. Uh, yes. And where we start to get into what everyone knows. However, before we kind of continue with my discussion on what I think the overarching theme is, I do want to take a minute just because we had discussed Haywood Floyd in before we really got into our discussion today and whether we feel his scene was actually necessary or if it would have been more interesting. He lives, I should say. But he's one of the type of people that it might have almost been more interesting to see die. Because one of the inciting actions of the Hal segment is that Hal is the only one who knows what this crew is doing, is actually doing. They just think they're heading towards Jupiter. Hal knows the real reasons. Now, the universe explanation as to why the crew can't know is because the public would know that there's alien life and whatnot. Um, I feel that's a little strange that the crew can't know because they're going to be, you know, separate from everyone for X number of years. Why wouldn't they be allowed to know? Um, I think what would have been more interesting had been if Haywood Floyd had been killed because that would present a situation in which secrecy was actually necessary. It would have been a, you know, this individual was killed by alien technology and we want to go explore the rest of it but we can't let the crew know because they're going to know they're heading straight into their death essentially or what could be their death so they you know might not sign up to do it or they might have you know alternative ideas about arriving there and everything like that and i think that would have been more interesting so a very a very similar situation to alien actually where the true purpose of the Nostromo all along was to bring back the alien, uh, but they knew that the crew was all going to get, like, wasted, just murdered by this thing, so they didn't let them know. They just think that they're part of, like, a regular space trucking uh, mission. And, uh, yeah, and I think that having that death would make it a little clearer at first if, like, the obelisk, like, clearly either killed them or just really like messed them up by uh with that ring uh it would make the moon segment seem a little more necessary than it does on a first viewing i think uh as we're gonna get into later it has a lot of thematic importance it's kind of an important touchstone but when you're watching it for the first time especially since it's already such a long movie you're kind of wondering why we had kind of this fake out with Haywood Floyd, because he's built up to be kind of our protagonist. He's characterized a decent amount. Uh, he's given a daughter and a wife. Yeah, he, he, he's he got all the typical signs of... I mean, he's the first person we see, I think, after the ape segment. Uh, so that he's really coded as, like, a protagonist, and of course he, he isn't. He's not really that important to the main driving action of the rest of the movie. And also, the information that we're given in this Moon segment is more or less repeated later on, after Hal is shut down. Uh, Floyd himself, that's how we know he's alive, he comes back and basically gives a video summary of what the mission is all about. So it does leave you sort of wondering um, why we needed to drag ourselves out so long before getting to the main uh point of the m- point of the story point of the movie uh but i think that you had some other ideas about that yeah um there is a reason that we kind of need to arrive on the moon and that's another part that's going to go into my whole theme wrap up that i have planned for after we've reviewed individual lives and deaths because 
it's overarching the whole thing and you need to understand each kind of individual piece to get to the next step which the next step as we said is hell um hell in case you don't know is this super advanced robot who is essentially controlling everything on the ship he is the life support he is the launch bay you name it he controls it he's also kind of sentient and they allude to that in their on a newscast where they're asked do you think he has feelings do you think he's sentient and whatnot and uh they kind of give a it's it's hard to say we don't actually have an answer for you on that one um well eventually there is a malfunction on one of the parts on the ship or hal says there is as it turns out they can't find any real issue with it when the data is sent back to a separate hal unit on earth that hal cannot find issue with the part either so they play along in trusting hal they put the communication piece back on the ship where it belongs and then have a discussion with hal about whether they feel he is fit to do what he is doing. Does he think that there is a glitch, some sort of error? He assures them that there is not. So they take a minute to the two crewmen, I apologize, uh, Frank Poole and Dave Bowman, take a minute to discuss what they should do about Hal. They head to a pod, seal everything off so Hal cannot hear them, and decide that if this part does not fail, as Hal is promising, they're going to need to find a way to shut Hal off. Now, while Hal cannot hear this, he can understand this through reading lips. Don't question it, just roll with it. Um, He's a robot, and he's smarter than you and me. He can read the lips. <laughs> exactly, exactly. What What are you questioning? There's nothing to question. He's, he's, he's a robot. Um... So, Hal understands that there is this element of threat to his being. So, he begins to act in self-preservation. Keep that in mind, because the last person who did this were the monkeys. In acting in self-preservation, he kills the three crewmen that they that Poole and Bowman had with them. They were just in cryosleep. They just you know pulled the plug on them. He also kills Poole. Um, he, Poole goes out to play around with this part, and Hal cuts his air hose. Um, you know, in space, this kills the doctor. He, Poole then drifts away. Dave sees this and takes it upon himself to, despite not knowing whether Poole is alive or dead go into the vacuum of space in one of these little pod things and try and save him. Upon return, uh, Hal has officially gone full Hal. I mean, that's the rogue AI term at this point. He's gone full Hal. Um, and refuses to let Dave re-enter the ship because he knows that Dave is going to try and shut him down. Of course, this is the case, and Dave works to shut Hal down in some of the most iconic scenes, the I can't let you do that, Dave, the Hal singing, etc., etc. And this is also where we learn that Haywood Floyd has survived, because as Hal is shut down, a video showing Haywood Floyd starts playing. It gives the true mission for the ship. It shows what the actual intent of the crew was to be, which is to arrive at yet another obelisk. Before we talk about what's about to happen with the obelisk, before we get into that uh, drug-fueled music video, uh, I want to take a moment to talk about the specifics of Hal as a character, mostly because I was surprised by how much I ended up enjoying this plotline, because one of my pet peeves in fiction basically are AI stories because there are only two kinds it feels like there's you know the classic kind like what we've got here the rogue AI your your terminators your hows your ultrons all that stuff um and then you have fucking chappy and we're like what if robots had feelings what if they were nice and, and it, it drives me nuts so um 
what I like about Hal is precisely that he is motivated by self-preservation. I mean, there's enough wiggle room to make you think that he had all some sort of, like, grand plan to, like, you know, he only faked, uh, faked the part being damaged because he calculated all the variables and this would be the most efficient way to help him get rid of the humans or whatever because he thinks he's better but that's not how i read it there's never any explicit statement of this situation and much like a lot of the details in this movie don't worry about it it's not central to what is happening yeah so just assume that he's just acting in self-preservation in this movie there is only what is happening on the screen and the overarching theme in my interpretation of it so, if we don't have the information that Hal is actively sabotaging the mission and actively looking to kill them, it's very easy to just say he's not. The other thing about Hal, too, is that he's weirdly given a certain amount of humanity, especially with his death scene. Like, he, you're, you're right in that he never does the Ultron monologue about humans are imperfect and I have surpassed them in every way and shall create a beautiful new world of AIs and rabba rabba rabba. But like when Dave is going in to shut him down, Hal can't do anything about it. Pretty much the only thing he could do was lock him out of the ship. He can't, you know, activate the turrets. He can't, uh, he can't like lock him out of the room. All he can do there is, all he can do is sit and beg for his life. And it's really haunting. I'm afraid, Dave. You know, I I feel I'm losing it. I feel it. And then, then then he starts singing. And it's really it's really sad and like both like sad and like frightening. Uh yeah, and it just makes the character feel feel a lot more like a character instead of just like a plot device. Uh instead of just the, you know, rogue ai template uh because he doesn't have quite so many cliched motivations because he is tapping into that uh you know primal feeling of self-preservation that we see illustrated at the beginning uh with the apes and it brings it uh back together in a way that feels really emotionally resonant uh in that moment hell as he dies is the only death that we really focus on um, everyone else dies very quickly and very shortly. And focusing on this completely inhuman AI and its slow shift towards self-awareness and its its pleading to not die, it, it, this humanization of it is so incredibly powerful and and lingers with you for a long time. It's it's a rough scene to watch, and I was not expecting it to be it we are in this day and age really conditioned for these robot death scenes to be action fight scenes and as you said dodging the turrets and shooting the containment unit that has his portable hard drive brain in it and whatnot and it'll, it's have, it'll have a big old core in a jar and like sparks will be coming off and you gotta blow it up and all that shit <laughs> it's it's not any of that it's just this slow methodical extraction of hard drives as it slowly, slowly begs for mercy, asking to save its life, saying it made a mistake, admitting that what it has done was wrong, and it's it's gotten it out of its system. It's good now. I promise. I'm good now. Dave, stop. I can feel my mind slipping. I can feel it going. Is the most human thing in almost this entire movie. It's absurdly powerful. It is absolutely incredible. If go go look it up. If if either go look it up or click on the link below. I, I, I can't recommend it enough. Just as a scene unto itself. It is slow, slowly powerful. It's it's incredible. That's all I got to say about it. So, after Hal meets his pathetic end, is a good word for it? Yeah, I'd say it's pathetic. But not in, like, a mean way, you know? Like, when you think of someone dying a pathetic death, you think of them as that being, like, a like a cowardly thing. But it's just the reality of it. Hal died like anyone else. 
there is no noble way to do it really uh he didn't he was scared and he pleaded for his life and he didn't want to die it was pathetic <laughs> it, it was a pathetic end in in the very literal sense of the word so after he meets his pathetic end uh we are treated to dave finding the last obelisk um and this one dave kind of goes through i'm gonna leave that with the question mark because it's never really explicit what happens whether he goes through it whether the obelisk becomes unto him either way we go through colors and some more colors and some more colors and it's really cool for a while and then we start just seeing recolored things of the earth once again just going into my little nitpick of things went way too long in this movie um before ultimately dumping dave out in a bedroom it's just a bedroom um where dave slowly watches himself age in stages where he is in the pod sees himself outside the pod but a little bit older and is outside the pod he then sees himself eating at a table once again older so he then becomes himself eating at the table and then so forth and so forth until he ends up very old in bed and what he looks at is not himself but an obelisk and at this point dave does not become the obelisk but becomes an embryo in space with a planet circling it known as a star child not explicitly but i think that's just like what the colloquial term is or whether that's or that might be what clark called it in the 2001 novelization um and this is where the movie ends we don't really get any meaning out of it it just kind of cuts it's, you see the star child and then the movie's over and and thank god how how terrible would it be if like there was some voice saying like now look at the universe reborn like we have transcended humanity like that's what they would do in like some hack modern sci-fi movie like that's kind of like i love interstellar but that's pretty much exactly what happens in interstellar like love will conquer the universe (laughs) (laughs) i haven't seen interstellar and I hear such mixed thoughts about it. I don't know that I really want to. It's it's very divisive, but basically, like, imagine if 2001 was schmaltzy. That's a little bit of an oversimplification, but, like, it, a very similar thing happens at the end, but it's got that it's got that hint of schmaltz, which I'm glad this doesn't have. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so basically, I've seen it, just the better version. Yes. <laughs> All yes. right, cool. this is a better can... movie than Interstellar. I'll check that one off my list then. We'll, 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 we'll get to that. Um, so at this point, the movie has ended, and we have seen those who have lived and those who have died. And we have seen the obelisk four times. And basically, what my idea for the theme of this movie is, is... Proving that humanity is ready for the transcendence that comes with being a star child. Because the obelisk shows up four times. The first time it appears is after the apes have discovered how to use tools. After we have witnessed the first ape dying in a... And everyone, all the others fleeing in just pure self-preservation. We get the first obelisk. The second obelisk shows up after we have achieved the next step in human evolution. We've, we've reached that space travel. We've managed to discover an obelisk. This is where the idea of cutting Haywood Floyd's part falls apart because it's necessary to show that we've reached that next step in human evolution. We've, we've moved forward. So... The third obelisk appears at the end of the Hal scene. And this is where it starts to relate to, or this is where it starts to throw back to previous deaths. Because we see Hal kill everyone else off. And in doing so, he's acting only in self preservation. So this potentially next step, this higher being than human, acts only in self-preservation, and ultimately this is 
what costs him his chance to move on. Meanwhile, the human throws away self-preservation to go try and help his buddy who Hal had killed, the one who may or may not be dead floating in space. He he has cast off this element of self-preservation, which is another step required for the obelisks to accept who they are, for the obelisks to accept human as worthy of this transcendent being. Because, the, yeah, with this transcendence, there's got to be this rejection of self and that, you know, it's not just the fact that he's seeing colors. It seems more to me he's specifically, like, witnessing the Big Bang and, like, the formation of maybe this universe or a new universe or something like that. Um, and, yeah, and in order to do that, he's got to basically throw away his humanity and become something better. And part of that, uh, and, you know, part of that primal, one of those primal things that makes us human, like we were talking about with Hal, was that uh, self-preservation, like, you know, can't have that, can't have a self. <laughs> Exactly. The movie shows humans' movement from self-preservation-driven animals who don't have an understanding of tools to tool-using monkeys who can throw it up and eventually throw up spaceships. And these spaceship-using humans eventually work out where to go for the next obelisk. And in doing so, understand what it means to shed that last bit of animalistic id, shedding this self-preservation act and becoming more concerned with others as well as the self and it becomes more of a unity and the final foe is the what could be the next higher level hell the perfect being the one without fault but still has that self-preservation that allows us to get past it and proves that hell is not worthy of this transcendence but humanity is so when the fourth obelisk shows up after Dave has kind of died. I'm going to put it with a question mark because it, it, much like everything else in this movie, it's a little unclear. He then becomes the star child, showing that he can give up his self-preservation, that he can work with tools, that he can age gracefully and accept what he has coming to him. He has sought this his throughout. Humanity has sought for this, and Dave has accepted it. And that is the theme, doing away with the self for a higher plane of existence. It is very it's very zen in a way. It's it's kind of a beautiful core of what's appealing about science fiction because if you think about the act, even just the title like a space odyssey, the act of traveling space, it's the kind of thing that one person, you know, can never accomplish alone. Uh it it takes like all sorts of people like collaborating together to sort of leave the planet, uh, transcend the the boundaries that we thought were holding us down, um, and go, go you know going beyond. And I think it's even though it's not like when you think of like optimistic sci-fi, you think of like Star Trek or The Martian or something something like that where that theme is a little more explicitly stated. But when you look at it in the way that uh, you've just laid out for us here, like, that's that's the core of what this is, um, that really optimistic view of science fiction, despite the uh, reputation it may have uh, due to that rogue AI genre being maybe a little more cynical, like, uh, falling a little more in line with that technology is inherently violent, like, that idea that the match cut kind of proposes, but it seems like with that transcendence, the film is almost, like, rebuking that, like, it's like no, like we're, we're we're all like collaborating in order to leave those old that those old violent tendencies behind, you know? Yeah, it's it it is a movie about human growth and as uh, like it's funny now that I'm not sure whether I was just overthinking it and I was blind to it and I need to kind of come back around to it, but leaving the theater I understood that it was about human growth, but not to the extent that I was anticipating it to be. Um, like it, it's clearly about humans moving on from being apes, etc. That anyone could pick that up just on a first watch through and like without giving much thought about it afterwards. Um, so I mean, maybe, maybe my kind of thematic review of it is a little simplistic, but I think. All of these elements are 
present within the movie, even if it's just a little bit subtly. Um, so despite <laughs> basically this whole theme that I'm so proud of having arrived at being the plot of the movie, it, it is still a little buried underneath, I think. And I think that that, that is what makes it worth watching is that despite being very clear what it's about it's also very subtle with it and it's very subtle in showing how it it is as i said each one of these is relevant to someone dying the monkey showing the monkey's death showing self-preservation the monkey killing the monkey showing the use of tools the crew dying showing hal's drive for self-preservation and then finally us shedding ourselves by dying to become the next level. It, it's very, it is a very death-centric movie in an understated way. The thing about this movie is that even though it's kind of as you say that you can simplify everything the movie is attempting to say, everything it's attempting to do, just down to being about kind of the course of evolution, but... What's impressive about this movie to me is the way that it uses the medium of cinema to do that. Uh, it doesn't use a lot of words. You know, there are no, like, big speeches elaborating on this. It's all done through visuals, through sound, through giving you this kind of feeling. And I think that's what makes it feel a little bit more profound, even if it is uh you know, some, something of a simple idea, when, again, when you when you boil it down, it's that the film, through all these kind of weird choices, these long sweeping uh, shots, these uh, this epic swelling music, the focus on 20 minutes of apes, uh, the colors at the end, you know, the hippie drug trip extra- abstraction, uh, Actually, you know, you said Zen. This is this is this is very much like heart and soul. This is very much a movie of like this the late sixties and early seventies. Like, this is you you can feel that that uh that kind of peace spiritu- and love. That spirituality was what I was gonna say. Um, to to be a little less pithy about it, maybe. But uh, yeah, you can feel that kind of spirituality running through the movie. I think this is a movie that we'll never see again. There's never going to be at least in the foreseeable future, a movie like this, a movie that can slow down and doesn't feel the need to exposit at you. Um, it's it's not going to be a blockbuster. It it's it's slow. It's hard to watch. It's it takes effort to understand what it's going for. It takes some time to take a step back and think about how do these four this separate acts really come together. You've got the monkeys, you've got the moon, you've got the spaceship, and you've got uh, transcendence, I guess is a way of putting it. There's no expository dialogue throughout it. It's never, and then they went to Jupiter, and there they found this. It's very dry. It's very light. And as I said, I don't think we're going to see another movie like this for a long time. Especially one that just sticks so well with everyone. Like, I'm sure there will be art movies and indie movies that have a similar slow theme, but I feel like they're not going to have the same impact that this does just by nature of this being first, by this blazing such an incredible trail for science fiction, for the language of cinema even. It's... It did a lot, and it did a lot really wonderfully. It's just a bummer that it's hard to watch if you're not sure what you're going in for. With that, we've said what we've wanted to say. We're not going to kind of draw this out and continue to repeat our same points. I feel like we've already done that a little bit, but it's hard not to kind of gush about this movie. So we're going to we're gonna wrap it up here. Um, as I said, I'm going to post some additional links and stuff down below, so if you're looking to get a full hour out of this because i know it's going to be running a little bit short go check out hell's death and go read the original short story that this is based on the full one is in the link below um there's also i'm going to post roger ebert's review of this movie where he sounds like a condescending douchebag and it's absolutely a joy to read so enjoy that one um other than that though 
Uh, I've been Sean McKinda. You can find me on Twitter at Sean underscore McKinda. I also stream on Twitch every Wednesday and Sunday at 8 o'clock. Uh, that's over at twitch.tv slash helpless underscore Skippy. And I'm Jackson Keller. You can find me over on Twitter at Jackson J. Keller. And my tweets transcend humanity. I, I don't know, guys. I, I don't know how to make this one relevant to this. Uh, go Go look at my Twitter. uh if you want our hot takes and what we're coming up what's changing in the podcast go follow us on twitter at badh underscore cast we of course would like to thank lords of the highway for the use of our theme song it is suicide alternate take off the album high octane low expectations and look I i know it's not blade runner but i can see you're really upset about this i honestly think you ought to sit down calmly Take a stress pill and think things over. I know I've made some very poor decisions recently. Don't you go into the ground. Don't you go.